Welcome to the Best of MBS podcast, a collection of the best interviews hosted by Michael Bungay Stanier, best-selling author of The Coaching Habit and How to Begin. Today's interview is from the We Will Get Through This podcast. Here's your host, MBS. I am a literature student, so I have read a bit of Shakespeare in my time, some of which I understood, some of which I don't understand. But I do remember the opening lines of Twelfth Night, and the opening lines are, if music be the food of love, play on. Now, in We Will Get Through This, we're not really talking about love, although I guess actually now I think about it, that's a whole new angle on this conversation. But we're definitely talking about music, and I've got an intriguing guest to talk to, which I'm really excited about. I don't know Nathan. I, many of the guests I'm having on, I know a little bit, but Nathan is brand new, introduced by a mutual friend. So I am excited to introduce you to Nathan Lee Jones, who is a creative communicator who loves music. He's currently doing a PhD that explores the impact of music and lyrics on emotional well-being. So not only do I have somebody who's practiced in the art of music, but has an academic background that's driving insight. So this is going to be a, a juicy conversation. He's an avid singer-songwriter, and he's taken his piano all over the world, including performances at Joe's Pub in New York City, which I admittedly haven't heard of, the Sydney Opera House, which I have heard of, and I have actually done some gigging there myself, and even Google's headquarters in Mountain View, where I have also done a little gigging. So we've got something in common there. He has also produced original music for Billy Porter, Alan Cumming, and Ron Ross. And recently, he was the official music curator at the World Happiness Summer. And he shared his insights at the World Congress of Positive Psychology and the Australian Leadership Coaching Conference. He believed, and we're going to dig into this, that lyrics matter. And when we harness the power of music, we can change our emotions, change our behavior, and therefore, and ultimately, change our world. Nathan, how you doing? I'm well, thanks, Michael. What about you? I'm also well. So you're one of the few people that, when I speak to it, makes it sound like I don't have an Australian accent, because you definitely have an Australian accent. So I am so privileged that you say that, because a lot of my friends back home, they're super Australian. <laughs> they're like, dude, you sound American. And I'm like, what? What? I know. No. I get that as well. I told, so here's, here's, okay, this is two kind of traveling Australians bonding over that. No, no, no. On the one hand, I quite like not having a super strained accent. On the other hand, I don't want to be have my identity stripped away from. But yet, where where am I based? I'm now based in Adelaide, South Australia. So I have returned to my hometown, returned to the roots. So Adelaide, for those of you who are not that hot on Australia's geography, it's kind of in the middle down the bottom and uh, home, I mean, it's a beautiful city, but also home of amazing wine. It's the kind of this uh, home of Penfolds, which is Australia's kind of most classic, most notorious, most Boston wine brand. Absolutely. Well, I mean, we just crack open bottles of Grange every night, Mike. <laughs> it's the Adelaide Drake. <laughs> it's the Adelaide Drake, yeah. Grange, Grange is the top of the range Penfold wine. But okay, obviously drinking is one way to get through this, but let's come back to music. And I'm curious, you know, you, in the introduction that I read that you sent me, you talk about the power of lyrics. And I'm wondering, um, who are the lyricists that have showed up in your life and you've gone, okay, wow, that, and, and kind of, I guess, open the door into this being a place of exploration for you? Yeah. I mean, where, where do we start? I mean, there are so many incredible, talented particularly singer-songwriters out there that just pour their hearts into their music. And, and when you hear a, a, a lyric that connects with you, it's, it's pretty dynamic. I, I think for me, um, one of the first artists that emerged that I just started really waking up to lyrics with was, uh, was John Mayer, actually. Mm. Um, just a great singer-songwriter. And he just has this really clever, almost nerdy way of taking lyrics and then turning them on their head and having some weird resolution that really pulls on the heartstrings. Um, and so those singer songwriter people really, re really speak to me personally, like Sarah Bareilles, and Andy Grammer and Ed Sheeran. Um, nice. You know, what? I was, I was listening to a, uh, an Ed Sheeran song, uh, just yesterday and, uh, actually I'm going to pull up the lyrics, but I'm right here. Um, he says, uh, we could change this whole world with a piano, add some bass, some guitar, grab a beat and away we go. I'm just a boy with a one mad show, no university, no degree, but Lord knows Everybody's talking about exponential growth and the stock market crashing in their portfolios. Well, I'll be sitting here with a song that I wrote, 
saying love could change the world in a moment, but what do I know? <laughs> and those kind of songs, I'm just like, you know, when the world is going through a crisis, to yeah. have those singer-songwriters that can take their pen, get some paper, write some lyrics, and connect with the deep truths that we know, mm. I think that's pretty special. I mean, you're, you're running a PhD on how to connect um, music and lyrics in particular to well-being. And I suddenly get there at a kind of superficial level. I mean, just, you know, I listen to music. I like lyrics myself. I mean, I start with Gilbert and Sullivan, kind of nerdy, extensory, you know, a wordplay, brilliant. And like Paul Kelly, you know, he's written an Australian singer-songwriter, has written a song for Adelaide, written another song called Word and Mu- Words and Music, which is about this magical combination of words and music. And for me, he's a truly gifted writer. But how does how does music and lyrics in particular go beyond just uh, look? I'm feeling, you know, I feel good with music. But how does it go deeper than that? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's uh, it, it's a funny one. It's such an elusive area of research because um, inherently, when you have a song, you can't just separate lyrics from music. They're kind of the same thing, the same yeah. experience. And researchers have tried to do this for years. They've tried to take, say, like a song by uh, Paul Kelly um, and show that to some uh, listeners in one condition, then show another song by, say, John Mayer and try to compare by deeming one with maybe more negative lyrics and one with more positive lyrics and try and see if there's any difference. Yeah. And see, the problem with that, as we would know, is John Mayer is not Paul Kelly. And right. They're trying to say different things and... Some people may have heard the John Mayer song, but not Paul Kelly. And there are so many factors that are so hard to control with music. So experimenting to even to, to ask the question, do lyrics matter, has been really, really tricky previously. Um, but w- what I've been working on um, with my PhD is actually um, creating original songs based on my background of being a singer-songwriter myself. Mm. And what we actually did was we, we took this massive list of about 15,000 words, English words that were related, were related from most positive to most negative. And we're able to uh, substitute different words in different conditions of the song. And so by taking a word like vacation and swapping it for another word like murder, um, you're able to essentially change the meaning of the song. And um, But the music's held constant in both conditions. And we found, uh, it was actually the, the first time that this has kind of been empirically valid then, but we did find that positive lyrics that are kind of scientifically deemed positive as far as positively balanced words um, they make us happier. Uh, they have a huge effect um, on our emotions above and beyond the effects of music. And, and not only just positive to negative lyrics comparisons, but actually we had an instrumental version of the songs too. And having positive lyrics actually increases people's responded felt emotion um, above and beyond just uh, just music instrumentally by itself. That's really interesting. So you could listen to a piece of music and be moved by the by the notes, but if you have lyrics that have a, a certain amount of positiveness in the in the language, that will amplify people's good feelings. That's what we've found so far in the research. Obviously, I mean, it's such a again an elusive space to be playing in. Yeah. But at least with our sample and with the stimuli that we use, that's what we found, and it's it's a fascinating one. So, all right. I feel like we could nerd out on this for quite a while, or at least I could just try. I could just try and catch up with you around this. So yeah. the first place I want to go is this: there are times when the song I want to be hearing is less about I want a happy song and more I want a reflection of my mood. I mean, I just had this moment of going, let's see, I must. I was a teenager, probably younger rather than earlier, and I remember hearing Billy Joel's song innocent man for the first time mm. and just i was like oh my god i am that innocent man i am misunderstood i am noble i suffer in a martyry sort of way i mean you know full of teenage angst so <laughs> all of this speaks to me and that was resonant to where i was and i felt better for it whilst also feeling sad and you know a little maudlin about it at the same time so i'm just curious and to know about the the power i mean is there anything there that kind of like the importance of a song that is resonant to how you feel and how happiness or maybe contentment 
isn't necessarily accessed only through the happy lyrics or the happy music. Absolutely, Michael. I love I love that story. Just even that that experience with 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 the Billy Joel song is exactly what music does. I mean, it's it's been said there's a quote that gets posted on every Facebook page about music that music is what feelings sound like. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was a perfect example of that, where you feel in a certain way, and, and music's almost able to be like, um, it's almost like your your listening device becomes a music therapist in that moment, like it listens to you and it hears you. And I think one of the big mistakes that we all make is that, oh, I need to be in this space, and so let me ignore how I'm feeling and pull myself into what I feel I'm meant to be hearing and listening to, whether it's positive lyrics or an upbeat, happy sound. But the the whole point of music is to meet us where we're at and to amplify our feelings and that's one of the conundrums with some of this research is that there is there even sad music because if it's sad and we're feeling sad it kind of makes us feel better <laughs> that's right <laughs> it, it, it's a bizarre thing but i think really the main thing is to be heard by the lyrics whether they're positive or negative but it's not really the point it's about whether they're actually connecting with us and whether they're then helping us in the long run tap into our best self. So last night my wife and I were making dinner together and we we have a little sonus set up and Marcella goes, all right, Michael, I was like, do you want some music? She's like, yes. And I'm like, great. What sort of music do you want? And she goes, well, like not too loud and jangly and dancey because I'm past that, but I don't want anything kind of pastel or whatever. And I'm like, okay, let me have a hunt around. I'm like, I jumped onto one of the play, one of the streaming services, picked a playlist, and I'll say first three songs were perfect. There was a little bit of Dylan, there was a little bit of somebody else. I was just like, this is great. And then then it just went it just went bad. I mean there was like this awful kind of chipper, uh upbeat kind of slightly a cappella version of the Beatles A Day in a Life, which is this very beautiful, delicate all of those and like, oh my god, it's sunny and I was like, I'd, I'd been betrayed by my playlist. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. How do how understanding the understanding you're bringing me is that the um, music can be a, a kind of a, um, a precise intervention in how I want to feel or how I could feel. And how do I how do I manage my life so that I get what I want from music and it doesn't just trickle along the background being wallpaper or i don't just kind of default to just some stupid playlist yeah ah uh, it's such an important question and i love that you were able to at least within those first few tracks target what it is that you needed um and that your your wife gives you some criteria and you're like oh. i'm on it and she's like perfect i mean that in itself is a sign of your um what what Gardner kind of called musical intelligence that ability to just feel the music and understand it um and to tap into that language and I think to some extent, even though these algorithms of Spotify and Pandora are getting wonderful and um, they're, they're pretty smart, like I still think we're kind of smarter in some ways. We know what we feel. And we're like, yeah, that's not quite it. Like we, we, we understand that real deep dimension of music. Um, so so how, do, how do we manage our life with this? Well, for me, I think it's about uh, just getting a little more prepared. I mean, in this moment, uh, with what the world is going through, we're having yeah. to be prepared. Um, and if we need a special kind of medication from the pharmacy, um, we're not going to leave it for another few weeks to run out, ask for it to get compounded, uh, to wait for it to be delivered from no. the chemist. I mean, we need to do the work now. We need to create what I call our own playlist prescriptions. Like we need to prescribe ourselves what it is that we, we know we're going to need. So in your case, if you know that, uh, you usually like that kind of vibe around dinner time, and this is this is a thing. This is a reoccurring thing. Then to be able to create a playlist um, that that meets that need, so that when you do hear a song, um, you're able to add it to a playlist to do your homework, so that when we're in those moments, we're able to better tap into the effects of music and manage our life through just a little bit of smart preparation. All right. So give me some more specifics about how I do that, because I have two default modes. One is I go. I'll listen to Paul Kelly's greatest hits, A to Z, A to Z, and just to have rattle through all of those songs where I love most of them. Or, and so I stick to very much what I know. Um, and I'm like, oh, look, Paul Kelly, oh, and Bob Dylan, who is, you know, Paul Kelly is the Australian Bob Dylan. So I'm like, okay, I'm just, 
bathing in the lukewarm water of familiarity here, and it's lovely. Yeah. But I'm not. There's not a whole lot of growth going on here for me. Mm. Or you kind of go, okay, I cast myself adrift on a playlist, and I might get lucky, but that too becomes a bit unknown because I'm like, I don't know the songs, or I'm not really listening to them properly. How do I find the middle line between more actively hacking the playlist and growing the musical support that I want? Yeah, awesome. Well, I, I think for me, it comes down to three different components um, of our relationship with music. I think we've got this idea of, and I know, Michael, you're no stranger to this, this whole notion of emotional intelligence, mm-hmm. um, this whole area of knowing ourselves. It's something that we sometimes forget to include in the idea of listening to music. We kind of uh, jump on to maybe some other aspects, but we forget about how we're feeling in the moment. So I think emotional intelligence is big. Yeah. Um, and there's that idea we just talked about before of musical intelligence, where you kind of knew that uh, Dylan was the perfect moment for, for, for what you needed there. Um, and then this idea of lyrical intelligence, which is, I guess, kind of linguistic intelligence, but it's almost this uh, this kind of sweet spot of knowing how the lyrics land with you and sorting your playlists accordingly. So for me, it's those three areas um, and and practically putting that into play would really mean um, going through some of the themes that jump out to you when you hear a song. Um, There's some debate as to whether some people are lyrics people and some aren't, but if we're paying good attention, we should be hearing some of these themes. Yeah. Personally, I like to create playlists based on the themes. So if if I hear a song, Um, that's talking about forgiveness. And it's like, whoa, I'm not even ready to hear this right now, but whoa, (laughs) I'll put that in a playlist called forgiveness um, and save it for later. And then then sometimes I'll go even further, I'll put it in a playlist called forgiveness, but uh, it's more of a softer, gentle song, so I'll put it in that playlist. So working backwards, when I'm using my emotional intelligence, I'm saying I'm feeling a little low right now, um, and what's going on in my life? What what, what am I really struggling with? Well, I'm struggling with my mum. As everyone is I'm struggling with my mum. Your mom, your mother is a nightmare, quite frankly. <laughs> from the oh, you've missed her. Well, that's well. You, you said we're all struggling with your mum, and I'm just like very angry here. Oh, I see, I see. Well, um, I love. <laughs> you know what? I'm sure the world is struggling with it. Um, but she's a beautiful lady. Um, so just to be able to tap into something like that to say, "Cool, I'm in this down low spot. I don't need to hype myself up with happy music." Mm-hmm. In this but I do need to refocus to what I know is true. And so you've got a playlist called Forgiveness. You play it and it's like you're in a movie where, you know, the soundtrack comes on and the right, word, right moment you're walking, well, I shouldn't say down the street, you're walking through your lounge room um, and you're just feeling what it is that you were meant to feel in that moment. And, and that comes through just a little bit of clever curation to, to bring you to that point. How many songs are a typical playlist of yours? Because one of the things that I notice is I like, I just seem to lack the imagination of building a playlist. So I have, oh, here's a playlist that's got 400 miscellaneous songs that I kind of like on it. But yeah. it sounds like yours is a uh, more playlist, but but probably shorter. That's correct. Yeah. I, I mean, 400 is great. That kind of turns for me into, into a radio station, which is yeah. great because you can put it on shuffle and you've probably got more variety than any hit music station in your city. But um, (laughs) I think um, for for me, my playlists start generally quite small, but they're super targeted. And so there'll be some playlists I start that are on this kind of random topic, um, strength with an adversity or something even more just, Mm -hmm. um, um, and maybe they're just three songs at first, but they grow over time. And, um, and for me, I've been really actively kind of playlisting based on psychological character strats for about five years now, and the, and the lists just grow and grow over time. Nice. Is there any guidance you'd give us around things not to do or kind of rookie mistakes to kind of avoid when you're thinking about curating your own musical experience so that you have a stronger amplifier of what matters to you? <laughs> yeah. I, do you know, I think the biggest trap that and I fall into this as well. I think most people that start playlists, um, we kind of go for the low hanging fruit. We, we go for the for the for the cheap shots. I'm seeing a lot. I'm seeing a lot of playlists at the moment that everyone's making because hashtag COVID nineteen is the thing yeah. people are talking about. And so um, you create a playlist that trends on that. And so you've got 
Britney Spears, Toxic. Uh, the Police, Don't Stand So Close To Me. MC Hammer, You Can't Touch This. Um, and uh, as soon as you say it, they'll be like, could you, not have, could you not have tried a little harder? <laughs> exactly. I mean, but they look great for a playlist. And so people like add it and share it because it's got that, that really quirky, clever kind of, yeah, I shouldn't say viral. It's not the right word anymore, but that kind of <laughs> sense where it kind of, it kind of takes off, you know? And so yeah. it's a real easy thing to do that and to start searching in Spotify for track names that represent it. But generally that doesn't really represent what the song's about. Um, right. And then even more than that, if you're doing a playlist that's trying to help you through that, to have a song by Maroon 5 saying harder to breathe, like, I mean, it's, it makes for a great, makes for, you know, a humorous playlist in itself, but it's probably not the best thing that we necessarily need. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, it's really about, um, I mean, good things take time. Right. The good news is we've got plenty of time at the moment, but yeah. it's about really just diving in and just paying closer attention to, to what it is the songs are trying to tell us. And as a final question, how do you get serendipity into your life? Like how, how do you, um, keep getting new music showing up and uncovering the new stuff? Because I, I am, I, you know, like I'm a classic old white dude listening to classic old white dude music. And part of me is like, I don't care, Billy Joel's awesome. And part of me is like, come on, Michael, Billy Joel is awesome. And he's also 1976. Can we not, can we now move into 2020, please? So how do you keep, how do you keep finding new stuff you love? Yeah. I mean, it's a great question for, for, for all that, you know, we could say that Spotify could do better. They're an amazing platform and they're getting better at helping us find new artists too. I find that uh, if you look on your, at least on my desktop version of Spotify, when you have a playlist, uh, they'll actually have recommended songs that come up afterwards as well. And you could see there's a list below that you can keep refreshing and keep finding new music through. Nice. Now do bear in mind that Spotify don't, they don't take lyrics into account in their algorithm. It's, it's really about the musical features, but mm-hmm. it does give you a good chance, at least musically to tap into more of what you want. Um, so, so that's a really good way of finding it. I, I also find that, um, when we're paying attention, when we're in this state of curiosity, um, you can really become a bit of a music detective. Mm-hmm. I use Shazam for this often if I'm in the yeah. supermarket. I, I, I gravitate towards pop. So, I mean, supermarket music for me is like, most people hate it. I'm just like, amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I mean, I, I do have a pretty far, far reaching taste as well. But when I see something uh, in a movie, if I'm watching a movie, a um, YouTube video, something comes up, I'm, I'm able to, to take that song and harness it and save it to a playlist, even if I don't know which category it belongs in, I'm going to hold on to it. And, and then we can use that curiosity to maybe go to a site like uh, genius.com where they annotate uh, thoughts behind the music or oh, cool. um, you look at a YouTube video of uh, the artist and what they're talking about with the song. Um, and, and if it's not a big artist, you can write to be artist. I, I know people have written to me about my music before and they, they love it. But finding new ways to connect more deeply with the song, maybe asking the artist for other recommendations seeing you know what other artists listen to that that same artist is listened to by it, it just takes a bit of time and effort but it's so rewarding because we're able to find ourselves in the music and we're able to relate to it on, on a deeper level so nathan lee jerry's has been fantastic really intriguing and an unexpected pleasure and an unexpected topic quite frankly so this is cool um if people want to find you out in the world where will they where how can they get hold of you uh, I'm just online at uh, nlj.co. Um, that stands for Nathan Lee Jones. Co. Um, and uh, yeah, on on the socials, hit me up and and have a chat because I, yeah, I'm just so passionate about the way that we can we can use music to to tap into our best selves, and I'd love to keep that conversation going. Yeah, perfect. So Nathan Lee Jones, you're awesome. Thank you so much. You are awesome, Michael. Thank you, mate. We hope you enjoyed this best of MBS interview. Want more great content? Head to mbs.works. There you'll find MBS's new podcast, Two Pages. You can learn about his best-selling books, and you can join the newsletter. That's mbs.works.